Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. It's great to see you all. And um, you know that there will be a few people trickling in here today. We had a lot of people register. Um, but while we wait for people to join, I just wanted to take a second to introduce myself and also Melissa, who will introduce our panelists for the day. Um, and hopefully um, you guys know what BWCB is, um, but if you don't, my name is Janae Adams and I'm a second year PhD student at Penn in the Genomics and Cotton Bio program. I founded the uh, Black Women in Computational Biology Network to create a safe space for Black women to come together um, across the field to work together, learn from one another, and really just thrive in an environment um, of people that look like them and can probably understand their experiences. And um, we have a lot of events throughout the year. Um, this particular one is geared towards empowering Black women um, to move forward in their careers with more knowledge, more understanding, and um, just uh, more inspiration to move through data science, whether that's in biology, uh, social science, public health, uh, law, wherever that may, may lie. Um, and we really are excited for this conversation today um, to bring together so many different people from so many different fields and uh, really work towards um, building those collaborative efforts across science, um, social science, other different disciplines. So thank you for being here. Um, just so you know, this meeting today is being recorded and it will be on our YouTube page. Um, so if you have any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat, um, but we'll also probably have some discussion about our conversation today at a later date, which is why our recording will be online. Um, so yeah, thank you again for being here. Melissa, uh, would you like to take it away? Hi guys, uh, I'm Melissa and I'm a computational biology student and I'll be introducing our amazing panelists today. Um, so first I will introduce Asia Mitchell. Asia works in clinical data analytics at Medical Affairs at Invite, at a, te a team that supports clinical studies and informs scientific government and commercial communities on results from clinical, clinical genetic testing, um, communicating accurate and accessible information to empower individuals and inform communities on healthcare decisions uh, drives much of Asia's past and present work. At Invite, Asia leads analytics for, portfo for a portfolio of reproductive health products, including carrier prenatal and pre-implantation genetic screening assays. Her past work includes establishing data warehousing and collection from a statewide genetic cancer screening program, applying next generation sequencing to explore tumor evolution, creating large scale computational and biological resources for heritability studies and developing software for analyzing genomic data. She holds a PhD in molecular and medical genetics from Oregon Health and Science University and um, a graduate certificate in biomedical informatics from the University of Pittsburgh and a BS in biochemistry from Chatham College. Hi, Asia, welcome. And next I will be introducing Dr. Janina Jeff. Um, she's an American geneticist and senior scientist at Illumina. She was first that she was the first African American to earn a PhD in human genetics at Vanderbilt University and is the host of the and executive producer of In Those Genes, a podcast that links genetics, African American identity, and Black culture. She is specifically interested in identifying genetic variants that explain disease disparities across populations, as well as science communication. Dr. Jeff is a 2020 American Society of Human Genetics Advocacy Award winner and won the inaugural Spotify Sound Up Boot Camp in 2018. She finished her postdoctoral training with Dr. Um, Elmer Kenny and Erwin, sorry, Bottinger, Bottinger at Mount Sinai, Sinai Hospital Genetics and Farm pharmacogenetics and now works at Illumina as a global bioinformatics specialist. 
As an expert in statistical design and interpretation of large-scale genomic data, her research career was largely focused on the discovery of genetic loci that impact admixed populations, Hispanics and African Americans for complex common diseases. Additionally, she is known for her expertise in population genetics, specifically in developing and implementing pipelines to handle complex genetic ancestry for genome-wide association studies in, ele in electronic medical records. Join me in welcoming Dr. Janina. And then lastly, uh, we have Dr. Danielle Purifoy. She is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Geography at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. She's completed a PhD in environmental politics and African-American studies at Duke University. She earned a BA in English and Political Science from Vassar College and a JD from Harvard Law School. Her current research traces the roots of contemporary environmental conditions in the US South, specifically in black towns dating back to the postbellum area. She's also written about the legal dimensions of environmental justice and equity in food systems. She's a former race and place editor at Scalawag, a magazine devoted to Southern politics and culture and a current board chair of the North Carolina Environment Environmental Justice Network. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Danielle Purefoy. All right, so we're gonna get into some questions. Um, at any point, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. I'll be monitoring them and we'll circle back to those towards the um, latter of the panel. Thanks so much, Melissa. And again, welcome to the panelists and um, all the new people rolling in. Um, basically, we'll, we'll start with some questions I have already for you all. Um, if you would like to put your video on, um, that should be okay. I don't think anyone has slides today, so um, our computers uh, should survive. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just get started. So we will go in order um, for most of the responses of introduction. Um, so uh, Asia, Danielle, and Janina. Um, basically, we can start with how did you get to where you are today and um, why did you agree to be um, part of this panel, this particular discussion? Yeah, so um, my trajectory into getting into the data side of genetics, I think just kind of started by half and chance because I, um, my undergrad that I went to, we were required to do research in order to finish our um, undergraduate degree. And at that time, that was um, when I was first consulting with faculty about research projects, it was about 2007. And at that time, bioinformatics was like a new baby field. And my one of my genetics professors mentioned this area of science where you could kind of do your work on your computer and involve data and you can um, you know come up with connections between biology and human health and I was like that's pretty cool so I um, just kind of dove into that and also at that same time I was working um, as a nursing assistant in a big hospital most of our patients had cancer but a lot of our patients had all sorts of other um, ailments and when I had that clinical experience and also at the same time of, of doing research, I noticed there were a lot of um, inconsistencies with how we collected data at the patient level, at like the actual patient interaction level, and then how I was doing my research at that um, data set level that you know we would acquire from collaborators or from the public. Um, and that's kind of how I got involved in shifting towards research oriented careers and getting into the data side of things. And then from there, I, you know, focused on my training and got more um, experience in various fields involving biological data and the rest was history. Um, and why I agreed to be part of this panel, I, so part of my current background with my job is I work in reproductive health. And I think um, one of the misconceptions that we have with at least when it comes to women and especially black women navigating their reproductive health and their pregnancies is involving a lot of genetic testing because there's a lot of genetic testing involved in trying to conceive, conceiving and um, whether or not you even want to. Um, and so I wanted to um, throw my voice into that conversation if folks have questions about that 
um, and people who are actually behind the scenes, you know, helping to make sure um, your data is protected and we're doing um, a good service to, to make sure folks are out there having access to good um, reproductive health data. Thanks so much. I can go. Um, the question is, how do we get here? Is that right? Yes. Um, so I would say my journey with science started when I was in elementary school. I was, you know, always leading the science fairs. So I, I started off with me winning just like the science, the class, you know, the class fair. So I was the person who went in class and then the school and then uh, I started to go on to do even statewide competitions with the science fair. And so that was when my love for science started. Uh, but similar to Asia, when it became time for me to, to make science, I would say more of a postgraduate profession um, after college in grad school and doing my rotations, I really quickly realized that I no longer wanted to, I wanted to have as much control over my project as possible. And it seemed like not relying on a model organism uh, or my faulty lab techniques <laughs> or lack thereof um, was, a, was a good opportunity. And so when I was, um, really when I was in undergrad, it was my first, my first introduction into bioinformatics. I was working in what we would call a damp lab where half of the lab was you know, at the bench and the other half of the lab was uh, bioinformatics. And at that time, bioinformatics was just going on the UCSC genome browser and blasting the sequence. So um, things have, you know, really evolved since then. Uh, and that was when I, I started to get interested into bioinformatics. And then I went on to do a postdoc after my PhD. So my PhD focused on um, population genetics. And, and then my postdoc really dived deep into population genetics and understanding genetic patterns within admixed individuals across populations and the potential associations with disease. And so since then, like I have really, really been in love with the computational sciences. Um, you know, everyone's excited to be working from home. I've been working from home now for five years as a computational biologist. So this is, you know, my normal, my normal life. Um, and then I would say more recently, um, I have started to, and I would imagine a lot of the women on this call can relate, you know, having had a professional career and having to restrict a lot of your authenticity, authenticity in your identity. And then as you grow older and you accomplish more, being able to have the privilege to share more of it, or at least as the world changed, being able to share more of it has been a unique experience. So within coming into my own authenticity and identity and not being afraid to show it um, in professional settings to actually reclaim it and, and acknowledge that this is a part of my professional personality, who I am, um, I would say was one of the large motivators of me creating the podcast. Uh, and, and similar to like everyone else, you know, a lot of the times I was the only one and so another aim of, of creating the podcast and, and really trying to, you know, tell my story to young scientists and young computational biologists is to change that, is to make, you know, Black women in the computational fields something that's normal and not so much of a rare thing. I know some of the first speaking engagements I ever got were simply because people were Googling like black bioinformat bioinformatician, you know? Uh, and so I really, you know, hope that platforms like this and the work that we do um, will continue to change that. Thank you. Um, yes, and, and Danielle, sorry. Awesome. Um, well, thanks for, um, thanks for having me here. Um, and thanks for this great panel. I. Um, so I don't actually identify, um, so I'm trying to think about how I got here. Um, I don't actually identify as a kind of big data scientist. Um, I'm a geographer, um, an environmental social scientist, so to speak. Um, and how I got um, into this arena um, actually started for me, I would say my senior year in college, um, which was when um, Hurricane Katrina happened. 
um, and um, hit the Gulf Coast. And um, I had been interested in racial politics, uh, but had not um, had a, a specific lens sort of direction to go in with that. Um, I was um, actually uh, a journalist at the time. Um, and my experience, so I actually ended up volunteering in um, Louisiana uh, for a year and then working for city government um, on hurricane recovery in New Orleans for two years. Um, and that was really when um, kind of the, the intersection of um, race, place and environment really became, um, yeah, apparent to me. And, um, and you know, the, the field of environmental justice um, uh, scholarship um, and, and its relationship to law um, in, some, in some ways as well. Um, so I, you know, I'm in a geography department now. I did, um, I studied environmental politics um, at a school of environment at Duke University. And um, I think the kind of shift from what I think of as like environmental social science to geography isn't actually a large leap um, because geographers actually, um, particularly physical geographers are working on ecology um, environmental systems all the time. Um, but I do think um, that uh, the difference for me is a kind of um, focus more on thinking about how Black folks in particular um, relate to the places that they're in, right? What they are, um, uh, what they confront in the places that they live in, what the conditions are on the ground, what they might be exposed to and how it relates to these sort of questions of data um, is that, you know, I actually do kind of the, I have specific research questions and I try the methods that help me to best answer the questions. And a lot of environmental justice scholarship um, has been focused on big in statistical analyses. Um, and those analyses have been important for, um, you know, very important for understanding kind of, um, you know, disproportionate exposures um, to um, various forms of hazards and toxicity uh, for um, communities of color and low income communities. Um, but, um, and those, that information has been really helpful for things like policy advocacy, um, uh, litigation and those kinds of things. I think I um, come to this panel as someone who, um, has a deep respect for that work um, and has seen some of its limitations um, in terms of um, like the sort of vast, like, like how, how small, right, the, um, uh, the kind of subset of things that we actually study in terms of our hazards um, is relative to um, the kind of total universe, right, of um, exposures uh, and conditions that um, I'm particularly focused on Black communities, and particularly Black communities experience. So um, it's been um, important for me and my work to really think through um, what is my data really telling me, right? Um, what are the conclusions that I can draw and cannot draw? Um, and those are in, in, in and what other um, methods or interventions are necessary for me to really flesh out the picture of what's going on in a community. Um, and I think about this in particular because as someone who um, trained as a lawyer as well um, in environmental law, um, I know the, the, the value of a lot of these big in studies um, for proving or disproving right impact or harm. Um, and so that's been, um, yeah, that's been sort of the, the, the crux of my thinking um, when it comes to, um, yeah, what we might call big data analyses um, and just really thinking through some of the challenges and uh, limitations when it comes to um, things that have very meaningful outcomes eventually on how we make policy about people's lives or what's okay for them to expose people to and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm, yeah, really happy to be here. And I, I agreed to do this panel because I was really excited to hear about this group um, and to actually learn from um, some folks who are actually doing this work more on a daily basis and in different arenas than I am. So thanks for having me.
Well, thank you all for that. Um, and as you can see, definitely this panel, at least for us, um, was something that was continuing to evolve. Well, maybe just in my head, um, but um, I think this could definitely turn into something like a series um, and really be focused on bringing together social scientists, lawmakers, well, people from different arenas um, in front of other data scientists. And so thank you for highlighting that and a little bit of your paths. My next question is, um, what would, how would you define big data? How would you personify it? Or how would you describe how it is personified today? Um, whether from your personal training perspective or um, from what our communities uh, usually think it is. This is for all. Um, yeah, so I guess for me, I would initially define big data as anything that is a, a data set large enough to where if you can aggregate it across, you know, all the different entries, you can make some sort of um, inference about that population. And then usually that's used to make some decision, whether it could be a marketing decision or a decision about healthcare. Um, or a policy decision. Um, but yeah, it is a really ambiguous term because big data um, could also mean, you know, in, in my field of genetics, it could, it could mean like genetic sequence, um, <laughs> which you won't aggregate at, um, at that sort of level. But I would say for most people, it usually means that big massive data that companies are aggregating or hospitals are aggregating to make decisions. Oh, and sorry to add the, the significance part of my work. Um, we, we do a lot of work with aggregated data. Um, so in, in my overall organization in our medical affairs group, part of our job is to provide these like greater statistics about um, various types of genetic testing. So um, in our field, our big data is the results from various types of genetic testing and what those means, what those results mean for different communities and different populations. Sorry, my internet is kind of going in and out. So hopefully I don't get cut off. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, I was just actually going to just naturally transition from what Asia just talked about and talk about it in the context of genetics. Um, I tell people all the time that everyone is a scientist, but more scientists and contributing to the field of data science. Um, and I say that because if we think about, and I like to think 50 years from now, um, our genomes and, and all the big data that is within us will actually be a more a uh, daily part of our lives, I believe. I do believe that big data is gonna be the answer to our own identities. Um, it's going to redefine how we think about our identities. And to Asia's point, it's also going to redefine um, how we take what we learn from our data and implement it in our in our in our daily lives. We see some of this, obviously, I, I'm sure we all had an experience when we said a word like, I don't know, toilet tissue, and then, you know, 15 million toilet tissue ads pop up in your social media feed. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see how access and how data, big data improves the way we live, how long we live, um, the lives that we choose and, and the lives that of others. Um, but I essentially like to think about big data in the sense of genomics, in the sense of us each having this large massive data set within each of us that can tell us about our futures and can tell us about the humans that will be here when we're no longer here and can tell us about the humans that were here before we came here which i think tells a fascinating story about humanhood really powerful words i think danielle i'm really interested in like any of your um, perspectives just coming from the the non-science um kind of how your definition or perspective of big data has evolved and what is that, what is, what, what was your reaction to hearing like, they are like the answers to our identities as black people? Yeah, um, 
so kind of like Asia, I was actually, um, I remember when I started hearing about big data, like first I didn't actually understand like what, like that it was like a term of art. Do you know what I mean? When people are like big data and I was like, what does that, but then it was like, oh, this is like an actual like thing. Um, and, you know, when it was defined to me, there was, it was sort of made clear that like there was some sort of threshold and I can't remember like what, like what threshold of like the amount of data like sort of crosses over into like you just have a big data set to like big data do you know what I mean so I um but I always assumed that um yeah it had something to do not very much to do with like exactly what I was doing I work with data sets sometimes that are like large but not quite reaching the threshold of big data um and yes and like um Janina I think there's this, um, yeah, like um, this approach or thinking about um, big data in the sense that it can, and it already has, right? Like intimately shaped our lives. Um, I have absolutely, um, you know, I'm wearing wearable tech right now, right? Like I have like all of the things um, um, that, um, you know, that contribute to what we call the internet of things and generate data. There's all sorts of, I'm sure, right? Like ways that, um, that I'm being marketed to just because I'm wearing this like watch right now and like that kind of thing. Um, I think that, uh, you know, as someone who, um, you know, studies racial politics in particular, um, I think I have some qualms and some challenges about um, the implications uh, for us in, uh, in the future. And when I say us, I mean, particularly black folks, um, people of color generally, um, because you know, big data occurs in, within a society that is, um, that is, well, within the society um, in particular that is, deeply racist has a very long history of using science um, to, um, you know, to exploit, to, um, to sort of uh, marginalize um, and, and to kill in a lot of ways, right, um, our folks. So I, I, um, I think that there's some really interesting like implications, like there's a, there's a thing that like, kind of feels interesting to me about it. And also um, at the same time, um, terrifying, you know? So I'm, I am not an expert, right? On um, the, you know, the racial politics of big data and algorithms. I'll leave that to folks like Ruha Benjamin, um, you know, folks um, who have been, um, even Tressie McMillan Cottom, like people who have been really thinking about uh, the implications of technology and data for, um, yeah, for our, how it intersects with our um, social structure. Um, what I, you know, what I can offer is as someone who works in um, environment, I think um, one of the things that was so, and I'm actually interested for folks who are, you know, you guys are working on genomics, um, uh, about, you know, and as someone who's working as an environmental social scientist, um, about how much um, we can say definitively about health outcomes and projections for folks, right, um, that are, are based on a genetic basis for illness, right, as opposed to um, environmental bases, right? Um, so, I think that's one of the things that is a huge challenge, particularly for Black communities, is um, that you know so much of our outcomes, our health outcomes and disparities, like have to do with where we live and what we're exposed to. Um, and I I don't see a kind of comparable push in the direction of. Um, better understanding uh, the impacts of all of the things that we're um, producing and manufacturing in a lot of these communities on um, 
one health outcome. So I'm actually interested to hear, yeah, some of your thoughts about things like that. Yeah, I don't know if it, can I, can I answer now or are we gonna move to another question? Yeah, um, you can answer because the next question is kind of what are those historical uh, forms <laughs> and uh, you know, ethical gripes um, that we we uh, established. Um, so, so do that for some. Um, it's so funny that you mentioned that because that's something that I've been extremely passionate about. Um, the second season of our podcast is going to be focused on what is truly genetic. And so I think there's a lot of misconception within the science community and within the community at large at what something, what it means for a trait to be genetic. Um, and so to answer your question, I would say particularly one thing that I'm even coming into growing into my own consciousness after doing years of work on this is that, you know, I think we severely underestimate the environment's effect, particularly in diverse communities, and we don't really know what the phenotype is. And so one thing I've been, you know, been wrestling with is like, what is the phenotype? Um, the likelihood of genetic variants being so population specific and being conserved in a modern population, given the quick shift in environment that we've had undergone the transatlantic slave trade, it's really hard to quantify that. And I think a lot of the, a lot one of the biggest issues with our community is that there has been a avoidance of this phenotype that we have called racism. And racism is a major phenotype that impacts so much of our environment. And trying to understand well, what is the environmental component. How does it enter? How if it is it caused by racism? How do we quantify racism, and how do we understand um, the environmental effects? And if those environmental effects can be uh, prevented, avoided, um, and, and cured? And I think no one understands the answer to that question. I think we're just now getting to a point where we're okay with even saying racism in a in a professional setting in our field, let alone detaching from the idea that genetic ancestry is a cause for disease. And so one of the things I'm, I'm really interested in, Danielle, and I'm glad that you mentioned that, is really understanding the complexity of something that is truly inherent versus something that is um, severely contributed by society. Um, and COVID-19 is a great example of that. There's a great article in the New York Times it is really short, but basically it says, um, you know, the reason why so many black and brown people are dying of COVID-19 has nothing to do with the fact that they're just sicker. The, the reason why they're sicker is because of racism. The reason why, you know, so many kids have asthma is not this huge genetic effect is because they lived in these neighborhoods where the air quality is poor. And so I think, you know, as we grow into this and as we, you know, really start to um, be okay with being able to identify this in a quantifiable and scientific way, then we can start to answer the question. I think we have to realize that Another part of the environment that no one has ever talked about in a genetic study is culture. All of these things play a part in health disparities. And we're talking now at least 20, 30 years of people studying health disparities with very little insight and answers. And it's not merely um, a lot of the onus has been blamed on not having samples. It's not really even that. I think the biggest thing is, are we asking the right question? Are we collecting the right data? What is the data and what are the questions that we should be answering? So I, may, I might not be answering your question, <laughs> but I hope that I'm, um, I'm hope that I'm driving home the point that it's extremely complicated, it's extremely understudied. Um, and I would even argue that it's not properly studied. Uh, yeah, a lot of great points. I don't know, Asia, if you wanted to add anything. The formal question was, what are some historical or common misconceptions or ethical strongholds on the history of your field that underlie, underlie the work that you do? And how do they affect Black people? How have you confronted them? Um, we've talked about, well, we've mentioned that um, having to grow in that experience of con confronting uh, the realities of both, I guess, gene and environment, or I don't know if I'm even using that the right way. How do we continue to do that as Black women? Or, or um, have you confronted any, not gatekeepers, but um, resistance or 
um, challenges and what do those structures look like on the way? Yeah, Danielle and Gina, they brought up, they brought up really great points and a lot of that resonated with and aligned with um, many projects that I've worked on in, in the past and, and in the present as well. And it is, I, there, yeah, when it comes to racism, which is the biggest confounding variable in a lot of our health outcome studies, there's no way to really measure that. We know it's there, but how we, um, how we understand its contribution to health outcomes, it's, that's, you know, the million dollar or billion dollar question, I guess, for some different industries. Um, I would also say one of the things that um, just us being here is also representation of is representation. So I worked on projects where we're at the foundation level of even just setting up our data systems, because we often talk about the data when we've received it, but we don't often talk about the data before we've collected it. And part of that planning process is integral and in what you're going to do later, because a lot of these especially in the healthcare settings, a lot of these studies, you know, the data takes years to accumulate um, until you get to a point where you have enough data to make, um, you know, inferences or, or results that can influence, you know, communities or and really help people. And often there aren't people that look like us at the table. And I wouldn't say often, always. <laughs> Um, there aren't people like us that are at the table and it gets really frustrating um, when, and I don't know if um, Danielle and Janina, you can speak to this, but at some point, you know, we all started out as interested, or at, at least for me, I started out as interested in the, the specific field of genetics and disease. And then somehow I got brought into race because of my race. And there's so many times where I just want to be a scientist that focuses on genetics, but because of my identity and the fact that I'm the only one representing my community, I also have to be um, an expert or I have to at least consider the aspects of race because not everyone might be doing that. And that has evolved into some, into some really uncomfortable conversations. And it's something that um, probably until the last year, I never felt really comfortable talking about it in a public pl platform because there is a lot of um, also external pressure to to like not make things about <laughs> race in a professional setting. But when you are doing things that can influence the health of communities, especially the community that you come from, your family, your friends, your parents, your cousins you want to be that voice that is not at the table. Um, so just even us showing up and being part of the decision-making process from day one to all the way to the end of it is um, in my experience, one of the biggest um, things that I've seen that we can continue to work on that is probably not always as discussed in the way of it, dis it, when we talk about like representation, we always just talk about like big numbers, but we don't talk about where people are sitting along that pipeline in the collection of the data. I um, mean, I can give some examples as we get into the, the panel discussion, but we can move on to other questions too. Yeah, I think you touched on some points of my next question, of course, magically. And also um, what uh, Alana put in the chat and we can talk about later, um, how do current practices in handling big data uphold um, structures of white supremacy? I mean, I don't, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> I think um, let's, I would actually like to, to get to the question about causal variance because I think that's one of the bigger ones, but like let's, Repeat the first part. Are you asking about the, how does, tell me one more time. I think it was just, how do current practices in handling big data uphold oh. the of white supremacy? Okay. Well, so I think any person who works in the field of technology knows that technology is going to almost 100% of the time have bias. If it is 
if it's created by someone who also shares that bias. Um, we see this in AI technology. We see this in almost every technology that we use that because the people who are who have been granted the privilege in order to create the technology are not representative of the people who are using the technology, that it already starts with an inherent bias. That being said, if we think about um, the more modern field of bioinformatics and the more modern field of human genetics, the way in which we define phenotypes, the way in which we test phenotypes and we develop algorithms have that same biased issue. Um, to a greater extent, science has, oh, am I frozen? Okay, I, I saw everybody freeze for a second. <laughs> to a greater extent, um, science and to a greater extent, these algorithms, like I said, are not being developed by people who use them, but without input um, from the people who are directly impacted by the things that we are created, they not only become biased, but they become incorrect. And so when we have in genetics been on the hunt of the causal variant, there are so many things that are at play. Um, and one of the big hypotheses in our field is that there is something unique about the genetic architecture of people of color that is contributing or that, you know, that that's how we find the causal variant. There are some cases where that is true. Uh, it is also true that in order to define the causal variant, you need to have a clean data set. We need to make sure that we're not creating confounding effects like the effects of racism. And so um, it's really interesting you asked a question about uh, an, like intellectualism, intellectualism and GPA because a lot of geneticists, and I would call them eugenists even, would argue that there is some genetic um, there is some genetic characteristics that describe how intelligent a person is. Has anyone ever asked the question, well, how do we define how intelligent a person is, right? So that already starts with this bias and what we define as intelligence, what we define as what we define as intelligence. So really defining the phenotype, creating the phenotypes is already starting off through a white supremacist lens, right? Um, when we think about these things, especially when it comes down to intelligence, violence, things that are also consequently used to continue to, to oppress Black people and, and people of color, not just in America, but in the world. So once we, we have to go there first, we have to then say, okay, well, if we're going to talk about intelligence, what does intelligence mean for everyone? Why do we need to know the answer to this question also, right? So like one of the reasons why people were justifying the answer to this question was that this, you know, white supremacist lens of what intelligence should be was baked into science and was going to be used to justify who and who not, who and who should not be having children, who were going to be people who were viable enough to produce the next generation of a population. That by definition, indirectly is eugenics, right? And so, the, you know, we have to question the questions, right? If the questions have an underlying white supremacist benefit, then the science will also have that. Um, I think one way of getting to that, again, is making sure that you not, you hear a lot of people when they talk in our field that we need more diverse participants in, um, in research studies. Research studies should not be designed to be transactional, where there is a science or an academic community who benefits from the use of data. It should not be transactional. As long as it is transactional, we're never gonna have trust built in. Um, we have to figure out an equitable way in which both parties equally benefit. And once we see that, then we can increase that. But one part of that is not just including participants, it's a holistic view of how do we change the narrative of some of these phenotypes that we're studying. If we're studying quote unquote intellect, then what are some of the barriers that prevent someone from having quote unquote high intellect? Why do we want to study high intellect? You know, really diving in and answering these questions will help us remove that white, that white supremacy lens. And again, People who are creating the technology need to be the people who are going to benefit from the technology. And even if the entire field has been founded by white men, we have a long, long way of going to backtracking that and make sure that we do have some developers and founders who, who look like us. Absolutely, a lot of snaps in the chat. Um, 
and great response. Anyone else? Yeah, that was great. And I would just add that um, I think in, in my arena, one of the um, huge issues um, in terms of thinking about um, this question of transaction um, and, and data, um, well, and research, um, you know, in environmental justice um, scholarship, this is one of the biggest um, challenges that um, communities that have been impacted by various hazards um, really have pushed back on for decades now. And so we've actually, there's actually now something called the um, community owned and managed um, research model uh, for um, particular forms of uh, research in terms of um, environmental disparities and um, uh, health impacts. And it was really um, driven by a, um, a, a community leader in a um, historic Black community in North Carolina um, who, you know, um, was a researcher. He was um, ABD. He didn't um, finish his uh, PhD but you know, knew enough about how research was supposed to go and knew a lot about the ethics issues. And when he was trying to get, um, you know, re, um, enter into research partnerships with the universities um, in North Carolina, um, including the one that I'm at, UNC Chapel Hill, um, really um, finding over and over again, this sort of um, extractive relationship, right? Where um, the university, right, owns the research they dictate what the questions are. They um, uh, they control all of the resources, right? Um, uh, related to the grant resources, et cetera, um, related to the research. And after a few rounds of going through that, um, really uh, collaborated with some um, uh, with some PhD students in public health uh, to really rethink how to shape. Um, research in such a manner that wasn't just about, as Janina said, kind of like more involvement of community in research, right? So you see that with like community-based participatory research a lot is like, that's still a kind of um, model that came out of the universities, right? And it's, you know, a step towards, right? Moving away from um, the sort of pure transaction. Um, but this model, um, I guess we call it Comer, it's C-O-M-R, Community Owned and Managed Research, um, really starts at the community, right? And so it's a shift to where the community um, uh, community members, or community leaders are the PIs um, on the research. Um, they um, have either full control or joint control of the, the resources, um, and they dictate the questions. And a lot of communities are wanting to get involved in research endeavors because they want, um, they need answers for their advocacy, right? Like they need to know what they're being exposed to. Um, and they can't just rely on someone kind of having a, a research question that question that's tangentially related to the, um, you know, to the, the issue that they're, um, that they're experiencing they're experiencing. So um, yeah, I can put this in the chat um, uh, there because there's actually a couple of uh, research articles that have come out about it and um, some piloting now that's being done at, um, I know North Carolina State University and one of the HBCUs in North Carolina and I'm blanking on it um, to try to think through how you can shift this model, right? Cause it's gonna be, it's a structural issue, right? Um, universities don't typically like to structure things in that way. Um, so that's, you know, that's something promising that sort of come out of, um, you know, environmental justice research and the problems that have arisen with it that I think um, might, you know, might well be suited or adaptable to, to other contexts as well. Absolutely, thanks so much for that insight. And um, I'm glad that we can also talk about some solutions. I wanna talk a little bit more about some approaches to how we both communicate the legal implications and also just the societal implications of how uh, big data is managed in black communities. 
um, this next question is for Janina and Danielle, is how do you engage those? Um, how do you engage the community of, of what's happening legally? Janina, how do you explore this in your show? And Danielle, how does your background in law come into play in the work that you've highlighted today? Um, for us on the show, we emphasize um, transparency. When we talk about the legal implications, we actually have an episode, <laughs> we have an episode, one of my favorite episodes called I Don't Trust Some People. Um, and really it's an episode of elders in New Orleans, which is where I'm from, um, elders in New Orleans who give that they would do a genetic ancestry test. Um, what's really important about that episode though is that we really go through line by line what you could expect to read and look for when you're signing up for genetic ancestry tests and talk about the things that could be done with your data. I think that if we talk about transparency and we give complete, you know, unavailable, available honesty about how I could benefit from the use of your data, how it could harm you, um, a lot of companies, a lot of entities that are collecting data tend to wrap that in the in the T's and C's that you have to sign right now because you need the app right now, right? And so um, we really want to make sure that we be as transparent as possible. We talk about the app, when you're talking about genetic data in particular, you have to talk about the future because it's not like you can just, oh, I can remove my data one time and it's okay, or, or my data, your data can be stored forever, um, even after you're no longer here, right? And so really going through, um, really going into great detail. And for that particular episode, we did bring on um, a person who is a legal expert in genetics who, who speaks directly to that and could speak to some of the legislature that we should all be familiar with. That is in the context of genetics, but now, you know, since doing that episode, the same is true for me whenever I sign or I point and click because it becomes such a mindless thing and is set up in a way that is intentional to benefit the person um, collecting the data. And so we kind of in, in, in a way have been forced to share data um, without many options of not to, right? Okay. And so if we need to share data in order to go about our lives, really understand what is the level of data sharing and that you're comfortable with. Can you communicate what you're sharing? Can you communicate what you are using and how it is being used to your family? And in that episode, we actually explain to people how they can talk about these tests to their elderly who may not have the resources and access to read these, these tiny fine print documents. And so my answer is complete transparency. And I would say as a person who is speaking to these communities, I have to hold myself up to that same level of transparency. Um, and in particularly having the podcast, is it's been, you know, of course, podcasts cost money and I have a full-time job outside of it. And so getting funding from a company who was looking to collect data for, for black and brown people would be an easy thing to do. Um, however, it's in direct conflict with our audience and the people who we put first. And so there are going to be, as we all go out about the world and, and communicate these things, there are gonna be some sacrifices. And I think we have to think about what are the personal decisions that we wanna make in order to kind of combat these bigger bigger systems of, of capitalism um, that, that kind of start them. Yeah, I think, um... In my arena, it's so interesting. I don't, because I, I don't actually deal with big data a whole ton. I don't think um, in my own research, I don't, um, I'm not thinking as much about kind of the legal implications for it. I think one of the things that um, I do sit with a lot, even in, you know, qualitative um, research, right, is the kind of, um, uh, the kind of agreements that you ask people to sign, um, you know, what does it mean for you to um, have control and ownership over the things that they say and the things that they tell you, um, and you know, to be able to do things with um, uh, with that information, right? Um, and 
and particularly in communities that you may not have necessarily built um, relationships with, right? Back to the you know issue of transactional um, research. I think one of the things that I'm often challenged with because people do ask me a lot about, um, ask me this question a lot about legal implications of, of like um, our research, whether it's big data or in other arenas is that, I mean, the law is created in this society as well, right? And so um, as someone who, you know, I came to law as someone who was really interested in like critical race theory, which sort of challenges the sort of very premise of that, you know, our laws are um, designed to actually um, advance the interest of everyone in our society. And that's just not true, right? It's, um, um, it's a particular critique and, you know, our laws are written, um, are very much written and heavily influenced, right, by tech companies, right, by big business um, uh, in ways that um, really more hinder, right, people's rights to um, their own information and that kind of thing than aid it, um, aid in it, right? And it's not to say that you can't use the law, right, um, to protect you in any case, but I, I have a lot of skepticism, particularly when it comes to a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, kind of mainstream big data issues, right, with like, you know, with tech and um, that kind of thing that these, the laws have been written um, at this point, right, uh, to, I, I would think, to um, uh, prohibit a lot of uh, claims of ownership and, and, um, and rights to privacy in, in, in various ways. Um, I think in the, in the environmental, um, you know, in sort of the context of my field, um, you know, what I see a lot, so for, I'll give you an example is um, in North Carolina right now, uh, because of the enormous amount of research that's been done on things like um, concentrated animal feed operations, um, which are like, you know, industrial hog farms, right, which have all sorts of, um, because it's basically spray fields of hog waste, right? Being sprayed on um, black and brown communities, right? And um, there've been a ton of health studies um, that have been done to kind of advance our public health knowledge about it. Um, and that has led to some policy and positive policy change. And right now what we're experiencing is this huge legal backlash from that from our state legislature, right? The legislature is trying to intervene to make it much harder for communities that are impacted by this waste to even be able to sue, right? To be able, able to have any kind of viable claim, right? Um, of, of a harm because they're quote unquote protecting the family farmer. And it's like, these aren't family farmers, this is Smithfield, right? These are like massive agri corporations, right? That are, um, that have bought out these legislators that are supposed to be representing these folks on the ground. So it's, um, so it's a very interesting kind of interplay, right? Um, where the law comes in, it's like, the law as it regards to the research that you're doing to protect the interests of folks. And we've actually seen in North Carolina where the hog lobby has become so powerful that they forced, they tried to force one of the researchers at UNC Chapel Hill, who's now unfortunately deceased, um, to give up his research participants, right? To violate the terms of his IRB um, uh, to, to, to force his hand in that particular way, right? So, um, so there's like those issues at that level. And then once you climb up the, the ladder and you get enough, you know, pushback and enough research out and enough, you know, policy shift, um, you know, you may end up with this kind of backlash at the back end to sort of prohibit you from doing anything about it. Um, so that's sort of how I've encountered, right? Like kind of the impacts of legal protections um, uh, on communities, um, because these are both communities that are like uh, being researched, right? Um, and so there are issues there. And then there are also communities that are trying to use the law to protect themselves against the, the harms themselves. And that's a whole other um, issue. And in the, in the two can sometimes, as in this case, get linked um in ways so yeah i don't have like a very good idea like good example from like my specific 
um, my specific research, but that's um, what I've experienced in, um, uh, yeah, in other arenas. No, that's definitely really helpful. And I guess helps us to go into better understanding my next question, which I mean, each of you have experience um, speaking directly to communities that um, who either whose data that you're using or um, uh, products or outcomes of the research directly affects them. Um, I guess we can start with Asia. Um, what is this like for you and your experience in either creating tools or better pipelines and workflows that are um, easier, easier to be communicated by um, the communities that they affect and um, what empowers you to, to do this sort of work. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, there were two things that I actually wanted to bring up um, about this. And one is um, being part of, so a lot of the work that I do is, is research-based. And before um, any patient um, gives us their data, they have the option to opt out of research. And um, there's this mechanism of getting people's data where you can have an opt-in mechanism or an opt-out mechanism. And it's a little bit of a sneaky way to collect data from people without them being totally informed. They're, they're informed, but they're not very clearly informed as um, Gina had mentioned where they could tell you exactly <laughs> how their data is being used and the, um, the whys and the hows. And I think this opt-in versus opt-out um, discussion is really important because it's a very simple thing. It's literally a, a, you know, a toggle, yes or no. And a lot of a lot of places operate on the different sides of that of that spectrum. Um, so that's something that when I'm talking to my family and friends themselves, when they are involving in some sort of data collection, whether it is health based or, or something else, that's something I always discuss is like, look to see if you're opting in by just putting your name or your email on something or signing up for something or if there is, um, or if you explicitly have to opt out because there's, um, there are places where you have to opt in to the research. So your data will not be used for any other purposes that you are not paying for. Um, on the um, the other side, the other comment I wanted to make too is there are there are many examples, especially in healthcare, where um, if you want to be part of the change you wish you see in the world, <laughs> the only way for us to get there is if you share your data. Um, and one of that is specific in our world of clinical genetic testing. Um, with clinical variants, because the, the thing that comes up here is that um, we have a lot of different companies and different labs, because you can get genetic tests at a commercial setting or in a hospital or in a research setting. And all of these places across the world are working independently to study a lot of times the, a collection of the same genes across all sorts of people. And then they collect all these different um, variants that they see in people they classify them as disease causing or not disease causing. But if they keep that information, then if somewhere else in another part of the world at another time, someone else sees that variant and they never knew that someone else saw it, um, not having that information would not help them. Having that information would help them inform their ability to say whether or not this variant um, was related to this phenotype or this disease. And um, there are a lot of gatekeepers in this arena <laughs> um, that can't, and I'm not gonna get into that. That's a whole other um, conversation. And Gina, you can probably make a whole podcast on <laughs> episode on that. Um, but, um, you know, there, there is that conversation that I also have with family and friends and, and at my company itself, it's a conversation that we have because it's something that, um, that we are heavily involved in is making sure that the results of our genetic testing get disseminated in a way that is useful to the greater community, but also mindful of the patient's individual preferences for data sharing. Anyone else? 
Cool. Um, thank you for that. And we can, as you said, um, definitely spend a lot more time on a lot of these smaller topics um, in the future. My next question is um, for Danielle. What sort of power structures do you see big data upholding and how places or spaces are created for Black communities? And for Asia and Janina, and as a response to that, as biological data scientists and communicators, um, how would you do so? And how does this impact your work on a global society? That's a really interesting question. Um, okay, to be honest, I hadn't thought about it in that way. Um, hmm. So I hadn't thought about um, like, big data explicitly, like, I mean, aside from kind of what we've already talked about in terms of like how at this point we have a, um, uh, we live in a kind of tech sphere, right? Like an internet of things that is really like um, poised to, has already shaped our places profoundly, but is also poised to shape our places in the future, like thinking about things like driverless cars or like whatever. And so that's that's like one way, one very clear way, right? That that shapes um, place. And what's interesting about that and how, you know, like our ability to do big data, right? At this point is able to kind of produce these, um, uh, work towards producing these kinds of, um, yeah, these kind of outcomes and these sorts of places. Um, you know, it's interesting in that realm is that a lot of the communities that um, I write about or in relationship with um, are not part of that story um, in the same kind of way, right? The like thinking of development in those places are not, um, they are like often, and because I, I work specifically, I should, I should have said this up top, but I work specifically in black founded places so these are places that are um, uh, like if you've ever heard of Weeksville in New York, or if you've ever heard of Princeville in North Carolina, um, the or Africa Town, right? Um, these are places. Um, sometimes they are embedded within like current urban <laughs> um, spaces that you know, that have kind of like absorbed the original black place into them. Um, and then, but oftentimes they're more rural areas. And so they um, they are seen often as places that are kind of like, like void of these sort of big data type tech places, right? They're, they they don't have like um, a lot of, a lot of times they um, may not have access to things like broadband, right? Like the things that, um, create the kind of access that's generating this kind of data. Um, and I think that that's in, in, and like, that's interesting in various ways about like how we think of black folks in the future um, um, or these black communities in particular in the future. So it's a, um, and so like, yeah, like, so I never, I actually don't think so much about big data in the context of which I kind of understand it to be shaping place as necessarily being the thing that is specifically shaping those places. It's more kind of like the, the, um, the absence of it. And I, and I, but I think that that has like really important implications, right. And like both positive and negative, I think for um, like the future of these places. So for instance, you could see um, where, and I think we see this already, where like places um, like a Princeville, I mean, Weeksville doesn't technically exist as Weeksville anymore. It's more of a um, historic site to visit, right? Um, but a place like Princeville that actually does exist as a town right now um, is really like under threat of a kind of takeover um, by the, the state, like, subject to land grab, subject to all these sorts of things. You may see some things that are very similar in the um, the Sea Islands, right? Gullah Geechee Corridor um, and the Atlantic, um, places that haven't been imagined within the context of like 
how big data shapes place now um, are also are, are then seen as kind of like obsolescent, right? Um, and so and so easy to kind of just take right, um, and transform to how they want them to be. So um, yeah, I think that's, that's probably the best I can do in terms of how I thought about it. But I, um, yeah, the, like a lot of the places that I, I work in are um, very absent from that story, but their absence makes them vulnerable in particular ways. And their absence from that also, I think to my mind, um, helps us actually understand like how we could do things differently, <laughs> um, you know, and the in the absence of those um, those kind of developments. Amazing, thank you. Any response to that? Yeah, I can. Um, I can respond. I mean, I, Danielle, I'm, I'm a huge fan now. Um, I one of the things I like that you talked about that we hadn't talked about is the future. Um, and, and how really when we talk about data and, and, and the use of big data and the power it has for predicting things, we're, we talk about the future. And I just want to just reemphasize what you said that, you know, uh, thinking about the future is not a common space for Black communities. We haven't even had the privilege and, and we're only recently now having media that support and that really highlight Black futures at a popular level. There has always been, it has always existed, but now it is becoming um, popularized and safe. And so uh, the biggest power structure, I would say that that keeps big data um, away from places and away from black and brown communities is this idea of what a big data scientist or what a person who can engage with big data looks like. Um, I think about this question, I think about, there's a documentary on Netflix about biohackers um, and it's just a bunch of bros, you know, who have nothing else to do but play around with their data and just like, you know, try CRISPR on themselves and, and do all this stuff. And it's like hobby, it's like a hobby and fun. Like thinking about these things is such a, is such, is such a different experience for a black and brown person. Um, a lot of students who I will talk to will, will feel like, uh, well, I have to have a PhD in order to do this, and I have to have this experience, and I have to have this door open. And you see a little bit of this changing with the rise of um, cryptocurrency and, and people who are mining cryptocurrency, but there's a huge barrier in place. And part of that barrier is, is just access. Part of that barrier is also just the, the very privilege of thinking about what are the things you could do with it and not even thinking about what, um, what someone who uses big data might look like or could be. I think a lot of times the way that our, our oppression is set up and so normalized that when we think about a person who does research, when we think about a person who has access to data, who has access to academic resources or even something as little as the internet, there is a certain uh, persona that comes along that that does not align with what we see in our communities. And definitely talking about the application of big data and thinking about the future is just something that hasn't been normalized in our communities. And I think as we start to break down power structures, even within communities around elitism, around things that you know de designate what a scientist or a data scientist or someone who should have access looks like, then I think that we can start to really change, again, the people who are developing these technologies, the people who are creating them so that they aren't um, as biased, so that they are beneficial, so that they aren't transactional when it comes to engagement. Thank you. Uh, Asia, anything? Yeah. Um Danielle and Janina both made fantastic points. And I just wanted to also add that um, going back um, to our first question about what is big data and, and Janina had brought up the, um, the idea that you know your individual data could be big data as well. And when we go, we, we also think about um, healthcare and access to an individual's lifetime of data for our, all of the healthcare that they've gone to, we also have to remember in our country, healthcare is tied to our employer. Um, 
it's tied to your insurance. You get access to things that can provide you useful data if you have X employer that has X insurance plan and if you actually go and see your provider and if your provider actually orders those tests. So there's all of these, you know, levels of barriers that at each of those barriers, racism, you know, plays its part to prevent people in our communities in the black community from getting access to. Um, and one thing that I've learned in my job um, because we are a global company is in countries where they have socialized healthcare, when everyone gets access to a test, we also get better data. Um, <laughs> so it, it's this, you know, feedback loop that even in the commercial setting, you know, when governments reach their communities where they're at, and I'm not saying that everyone needs genetic testing, but I'm just saying if it's something that you can access without having to have a specific type of job that can provide you health insurance, because it is your right of just citizenship, then we can get towards that access of people feeling like they own their data and they own their story, they own their health, they own their prosperity, all of the decisions that are ultimately made with data by other people. And I think that that's, when we talk about black futures, that's the black future I wanna see is where people feel empowered because they have the information. Thank you. My last question right before Q&A is a very brief one. Um, maybe each of you can take 10 seconds, but once I say it, it might seem impossible. How do you work to decolonize your mind to continue doing the work that you do? So I'll quickly say, um, this is a daily process. I'll also quickly say that because of the way things are set up, it's also a very new process. Um, and I, I also want to say that it's, it's not without knowledge to know that, you know, dealing with the, the trauma and, and, and coming to terms with the effects um, that power structures like supremacy, white supremacy, capitalism, and patriarchy infect your personal life, being able to talk about those things in your field and being able to deal with the trauma in a way that you can speak to them to people in the community who are either not conscious to it yet or <clears throat> who are not ready to talk about it yet is a huge privilege. I think, um, I think a lot of, at least a lot of scientists, white scientists in our field have this assumption that black scientists wanna talk about diversity and wanna talk about the things that, you know, have impacted us it's a, it's not an easy thing. It's traumatizing for someone to bring that up and, and then unexpectedly expect you to weigh in on it. And so um, I say that because for those who are able to talk about it in a public way, we are just one voice of an entire community of people who deal with trauma at different levels and aren't able to. And so Mine is a work in progress. I definitely have to make sure I don't desensitize myself. So I do take, you know, breaks. Like, I don't even think I watched the news last week when, when things are going on. Um, so you have to take breaks. And I, and I always try to dig deeper and, you know, question everything I read, lateral reading, you know, just like any researcher, fact checking the fact check and all the resources. Um, because now I'm like, I don't believe anything. <laughs> but, you know, like, I, I, I just question a lot. And, and so I'm always constantly learning. There's nothing, um, there's not, there's not a day when I'm not excited to learn something new, even something that I think I'm an expert in. Um, I could go. So I'm in, yeah, like I'm in academia and, um, academia can like put you in the clouds a lot. Um, and <laughs> those are some colonizing clouds. So I feel like my, the important thing for me is like um, trying to keep my feet on the ground. Um, so I, I actually work, I have the privilege like it, and this is a real privilege of mine to work um, 
really in the state and very, and I live actually in the, in the city where I grew up, um, that's home for me. And so um, I, um, I live in Durham, North Carolina and I love my city. And I try, um, I think one of the things that helps me um, is like trying to like organize like in my community um, to get as involved as possible. And I think Durham's a very black city as well. So it's, um, yeah, I think that really helps because it's amazing like what, <laughs> like what I'll like, you know, be taken away like in the academy and that kind of thing, get my my mind in one space. And then like, like, like let's say I have a community organizing meeting in the evening and like, it'll help me actually think differently about something that I've been thinking about earlier in the day, if that makes sense. Um, it helps. It's a like, it's a, it's like a, its own sort of reality check <laughs> on like how far in the clouds, like I'm ascending um, and sort of where it's a, yeah, it's kind of an equilibrium um, of sorts, if that makes sense. Um, and, and for me, I would just add just learning the power of the word no and backing out of stuff and being okay with it not coming across as unprofessional but coming across as as you know meeting my values and my values is if what I'm doing is not serving a community that I think it should be serving I can't be part of this or I don't feel comfortable being part of it so Definitely something I'm trying to hold on to as a grad student at this very second. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Melissa, would you like to um, help try to corral some questions? Yeah, so we'll do some live Q&A now. I have two questions um, that I'll go through. And then if anyone has um, a question, if you could just put in the chat or raise your hand and then we can go that way. So the first question I have is, um, where do you see the future of data in biobanking studies headed and why? Um, well, I actually think um, the future of, of biobanking is closer than we think. Um, I think that pretty soon I actually do think that this is going to be advantageous uh, for us as long as it is done right. So I have some fears around it. Um, you know, I've seen some examples where using biobanking in the connection with genetic data for the purpose of predicting outcomes uh, has been inaccurate. But I have also seen a lot of stories where it has been very positive and very life-changing uh, for an individual or community. So I definitely think about the advance of data and biobanking in the context of um, using precision medicine uh, to have healthier outcomes and extend our life expectancy. I'll add from my experience um, working in, in that area in model systems, because um, usually that the you do the work in a model system before you get to the work <laughs> in people. And um, we were able to find some really interesting phenotypes that had heritability. And, we, and this goes back to that, one of those earlier conversations we were having about environmental things influencing uh, a trait or genetic factors influencing a trait, they both can. And the, the longer, so, it, the longer we have a collection of things that we can test things in, the better we can get at determining what factors contribute to what. And in my past working in model systems where we have that legacy of, you know, decades of samples in a freezer that are well classified for um, lots of different animals that we were studying, um, we came out with some really good things. But um, it also goes back to that point that I made up earlier about having representation at all levels of the pipeline at that biobanking level, um, initializing that biobanking at the initializing of the data collection and how the data architecture is established and who gets access to what and when and how long are we doing this and yeah. 
but it's promising, like Janina said. And the other question is in the chat from Lauren um, Frazzi. She says she's curious about elitism and white male supremacy and technical work involved with using, managing, and analyzing big data. For example, um, specific modeling skills or backgrounds in coding, uh, specific um, programming languages, and how that plays out into day to day basis and to limit the hiring. Um, or opportunities to progress as biostatisticians or bioinformatic bioinformaticians. So, in summary, how I guess how do the access to those um, knowledge limit um, or gatekeep us from being in the more informatics field? Uh I'll just say for me, um, I felt like I would have gotten into computer science and programming sooner if I had representation in the larger media in the 90s, which now I feel like um, teens and, and younger people have a bit more of that than we had. And it had, and that actually had more to do with being a woman than it had to do with being black, at, at least at that level. Um, once I got into it, then it became <laughs> uh, my Black identity also was like, oh, well, there's none of us here too. But um, I will say that the more that you do just push through, it does get a lot easier. Um, but that initial part, it's hard to feel like you have a place when you don't see anyone that shares a similar identity. I, there were many um, places I was in where I was the only woman, and I was definitely the only black person. I was the only not white or Asian person. Yeah, if anyone has any more questions, um, while you guys type up your questions or raise your hands, I have um, I have a question for Janina. I see the beautiful art and books in your background. And I was just wondering what, it, what um, in your background is like one of your favorite books or pieces back there? Yeah, so uh, this background comes from a local Black-owned bookstore here in New Orleans called Community Bookstore. Um, but actually, I do have a book if anyone is interested. I am reading, uh, and it is called The Social Life of DNA. Oh, okay, hold on, let me turn this thing off. Because, you know, see, this is what happens when you don't get to create the technology. Look, <laughs> hold on one second. Um, see if I can turn it off, okay. Um, it's called The Social Life of DNA, Race, Reparations, DNA Reconciliation After the Genome by Alondra Nelson. Um, and so this is a book that I'm really excited about right now. Um, I am also reading, uh, I'm also almost finished reading Killing the Black Body by um, Dorothy Roberts. Uh, you guys, so you guys are all not, yeah that whole list. <laughs> and I'm also writing a book, but it'll be a, it'll, it's not coming out anytime soon. So, <laughs> but be on the lookout. Yeah, I'd love to hear others' uh, book recommendations. Um, I've been reading Weapons of Mass Destruction. Um, I think it's by Kathy O'Neill. And she's not black, but <laughs> it is a book about data science and some of the algorithms that have impacted um, a lot of different communities, and specifically the black community. And it's been, it was enlightening to learn about some of the financial decisions that resulted in the financial crisis um, back in 2008, 2009, and um, the involvement in that. So. I have, I have that book on my Amazon wish list and I've been meaning to buy it and, and read it. Yeah, I would just say, I would second Alondra Nelson and um, Dorothy Roberts, anything that Dorothy Roberts has written. Um, I think uh, another book that um, I hear a lot about um, is um, Algorithms of Oppression by Safia Noble. Um, and then, oh shoot, 
it's I mentioned Ruha Benjamin and it's like race for technology. I can't remember the the title. I'll get it. Um, but um, yeah, just folks who are writing on things that are pertinent to this um, to this discussion. Um, I actually um, have been. I I I read. Um, I'm teaching this semester um, a book. Um, of speculative fiction, Parable of the Sower um, by Octavia Butler, um, which is not about big data. It's not, um, but it's actually about um, like um, the, yeah, it's about the social collapse of the United States um, and kind of how people are trying to figure out um, yeah, how to kind of create a future. Um, and this is a, you know, Octavia Butler is a, a, a black science fiction author um, or was, she's, I'm deceased now, but yeah. So I, I recommend that. And I think it just, it takes on some of the themes um, that we've been talking about um, in terms of, um, yeah, corporate, uh, corporate control, right, of, um, of society. Um, ecological kind of um, collapse, like what people kind of do with the, or try to do with the kind of power that they have um, over folks and how that kind of ultimately like leads to the sort of social breakdown of the, of the country. So it's kind of depressing, but it's also like interesting to think about um, <laughs> what else we could build. <laughs> um, yep. I just gonna say I also got a new Octavia but not new but new to me Octavia Butler series. Uh, um, uh, well, the first book is called Wild Seed and the second book is called uh, Mind of My Mind. Uh, and I've been they've been highly recommended because there's like some genetics in there or a play upon genetics. So yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> awesome! Thanks for the book recommendations. Um, I there's another question in the chat and then afterwards I think we'll wrap up and so Jane asks how do you handle family and science life I can chime in on that I um <laughs> it's a that's a that's a process I would um, I don't know about Danielle and, and Janina's background, but I'm a first generation college student and graduate and then obviously forced my family to get a PhD and we don't have any, I have a really big family and there's current, well at the time when I was doing my PhD and getting more into science, there was no one in science. I had one cousin that was in healthcare out of like, I have a lot of cousins. <laughs> so um, there was always this, um, misunderstanding about what I did or what I do or why I couldn't go to this or that because I'm still in school 10 years later. <laughs> um, but I think one of the, the blessings, at least for me, that I've had in this journey is being able to see in my younger cousin that level of curiosity about science that I can help foster within that I didn't have um, growing up and I can support them in a way that I didn't have in my like immediate family. Um, but in terms of like my like household, like I'm married and we have, um, I have a stepson and I'm also expecting um, a child as well. And I would say, honestly, all of that has been a lot more work than the science. <laughs> and at some point you learn that your job becomes, or your science becomes your job and your, hopefully your family becomes your, your passion in your life. You can still, you can do both. So. Congrats. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was, I would say uh, one thing I've done. So I think there's two questions. So how do I balance family and science specifically? I try not to make science feel so far away from family. Um, so like, for example, when I was in grad school, I had a tough time. I like failed my qualifying exam the first round and 
it wasn't that I didn't know it, but it was mostly because I was just like, I had anxiety uh, and people ask like, well, what was it? I don't know a single uh, black and brown person that like, I uh, couldn't, I would say majority of us, let me not say that, majority of us really lean into our, our communities and our family structures to help us. Even in my family, they don't even know half the things that I'm doing. They just know that I need support. They just know that they're gonna. They need to be there. I remember when I defended my thesis. I told my great aunt. I told everyone in the family, "Do not ask any questions. You are not here to ask questions. Just observe." And long and behold, not only did my great aunt and my grandmother show up in like floor length uh, first, they also my great aunt asked a question, and it was actually a really great question. And I was like, I should have never said that. I should always let them ask questions. Um, you know, the first part of my podcast, uh, the first episode of my podcast is features my parents. So this journey of being a scientist and understanding and, and, and growing into my identity as a scientist as an, and as a human uh, wouldn't be possible without my family. So I include them as an integral part of this process uh, in, in the episode four that I was talking about um, with the elders, my great uncle starts off the interview with saying he don't care about genetics and he don't care about if he's from Africa and then ends with asking me about admixture, you know? Uh, so it, it really, it really is a thing that, you know, obviously I, I say uh, family and science. So that's family and science. And then I would say family and professional life. Um, I'm very strict about my boundaries and being able to effectively communicate them so that I can be successful. So that's just like, professional life and everything else. I, I have a, a, a very, I have a very uh, organized schedule. I'm really a stickler about scheduling. And so that's just how I try to like keep things compartmentalized. But as far as family and science, I tell them that they're just as much of a scientist as I am. That's a great question. I, um, let's see hear part of my family in the background maybe my dog is barking so um I um yeah so I think I've actually been really interested in engaging my family a lot more than I did um in some of these questions um you know about my research just because um yeah a couple of yeah parts members um, I, of my family are actually from um, black founded communities. Um, and so it's been kind of helpful to think of like my own, um, yeah, my own genealogy, right? And like how it ties to some of these places that um, I write about. Um, and so that, and then also thinking um, um, about, um, yeah, like, how like the kind of different knowledges that exist right and the knowledges that exist in a lot of these places um where you may have um like or it, it, it very least historically right like you may not have very many people who have ever gone to college but have really vast knowledges about how you build a town, right? Like, or how you build a place um, and actually how you sustain it. Um, Cause like quiet as it's kept a lot of these communities despite not having like broadband, a lot of basic infrastructure have been around for like, you know, go, some of them going on 200 years. So it's like, um, that's a sustainability story for you, right? And so that's been, um, it's been helpful to connect kind of um, in that way with um, with family members and with my own um, history. Um, and then, yeah, I'll yeah uh, reiterate, echo um, uh, Janina about boundaries. Like I didn't have very good boundaries when I was in graduate school. Um, I burn out, I was burnt out a lot and um, I'm trying to, I've been working on changing that since then. Um, and I'm just now feeling like I've got a rhythm where I'm like not feeling exhausted most of the time. Um, so yeah, but it took a long time for me. So I'm like, I congratulate anyone who has like, yeah, worked through that and figured it out, especially if you've, if you've done it at the grad school level, but start now, you know, if you're 
if that's something that you're struggling with because it just doesn't end. Like I thought it would get easier for some reason, like in academia, but it doesn't. You just have to, you just have to figure out, <laughs> you just have to say no, so. Well, thank you again, everyone. Um, we got to a lot of points and there's a lot of questions we didn't even get to, but thank you so much for all of the, the awesome discussion. And again, another round of applause for the panelists and uh, their time today. Um, if you would like to know more about us, please go on to blackwomencompbio.org. Um, we are a rapidly growing organization and always looking for new ways to collaborate with other scientists and other communities. Um, and this is uh, just, just the start of us starting our 2021 uh, and doing that. So thank you again for being here and um, wish you all the, the best week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everyone.